All right, so in this video, we're gonna talk about a subject that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. And I wanna talk about cameras that are on the market that are quite old, but have really come down in price. And I think are definitely cameras to consider when looking for your next cinema camera. Maybe you've started in this field. Maybe you were like, I want to get into filmmaking. I want to do cinematography for a living or whatever. And you started out with a mirrorless camera, but you're trying to kind of move up into the quote unquote cinema camera market, that game where you're getting a camera that's definitely video focused and has all the features that you would expect from a professional cinema camera. And I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone that really wants those features that are using it for commercial work, music video work, short film work, stuff like that. Less a doc work for sure. Because where I really want to compare this from a spec level is probably something like the Sony FX3 or Sony FX6. But I would say the FX6 is definitely more of a dock style camera with its internal NDs, everything built into the body, all the features that it has. First, what we're talking about today, which is much more cinema camera focused. And I know they call the FX line of Sony's a cinema camera, but it's kind of hard to say that when it doesn't shoot raw or 12 bit or 16 bit. I mean, even the, what the FX, Three just recently got 180 degree shutter options on it. So that we're, we're, we're treading the line on what a cinema camera really is. Of course, any camera that you can use for cinema would be considered a cinema camera. But what we're talking about today is like, you know, a professional camera, a camera that you get your hands on, you use it and you're like, this is what this camera was designed to do. What I wanted to talk about today really is old red cameras. So red cinema cameras, you know, the brand red, it shot, huge movies before in the past, still shooting big movies today. But up until recently, the RED camera brand was very expensive. Obviously, when it comes down to a RED Komodo, like the camera that I have, you can get a body for $6,000 new, or you can get the RED Komodo X, which is the just a little bit level up for $10,000 new, and a used body of a RED Komodo for somewhere between like four and five grand right now. But what's really interesting right now is that, so, you know, RED started out with the RED one. I'm not gonna get into the full history of RED, but that camera I would not recommend using. It just takes like two minutes to turn on. The media stuff is hard. It doesn't have as much dynamic range. It weighs like 16 pounds. I would not recommend that camera. But once they upgraded to the DSMC-1 body style, things start to get interesting because that was, I mean, that was like 10 years ago at this point. But I feel like that those camera bodies are still useful today. Now you can get a Red Epic or a Red Scarlet for like under $3,000 used right now. Granted, they are old cameras. They have old sensors, but these old sensors really still compete with the modern sensors. Cause you have to think that, yes, it's a 10 year old sensor, but these sensors were the best of the best at the time, right? So you have like, a, you had an Arri Alexa basically, and you had Red, they had different, reasons for existing the red was kind of a resolution raw uh, more kind of like owner operator style camera whereas the alexa was much more like a studio based camera at that time it weighed 16 pounds it was a big body you sort of needed a crew to use it whereas the red was like got really popular because people could own and operate them first off they were cheaper than alexa's just right out of the gate and they were more modular and smaller they were basically the size of an alexa mini before the alexa mini came out they had touchscreen controls they had this body that basically didn't have very many cables on it and had all the io that you needed so it was that kind of in between and that's where i started my career i started my career filming all of the major stuff that i ever did on the red epic specifically the red epic mx which is the same sensor that shot something like the very first first two seasons of House of Cards, The Social Network. A lot of like 3D movies were shot on the Red Epic. A lot of Ridley Scott movies were shot on Red Epic. So the camera really worked in Hollywood, you know, 10 years ago. But I think it was like about eight years ago, I probably have my dates wrong on that, but they came out with the Red Dragon sensor, which was an upgrade to the original body, the DSMC-1 Epic body, but they put a new sensor in it. Now this new sensor was kind of the game changer, right? It was still a 5K sensor, like the Red Epic MX, but it gave you way more latitude and was just a better sensor overall, better colors overall, more highlight latitude. That was the kind of the biggest thing about it. Of course, still to this day, they say that their sensors are rated at 16 and above stops of dynamic range. We all know that like in testing, it doesn't really quite get there. It's definitely not Alexa level, but it's very close. But the Red Dragon sensor really was like their workhorse sensor for a very long time. If you got the original DSMC-1 body with a Dragon sensor upgrade in it, which was cool that Red used to do that. You could just upgrade your sensor for a small fee and keep your camera and not have to spend another 40, 50 grand. You had a really nice setup. That shot things like Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, Gone Girl, all the David Fincher stuff was shot on Dragon. First season of Mindhunter, really beautiful stuff was shot on that camera. I have one here right now to test out and let me show you the features of this camera and show you how cool it is still today in 2024. It kind of looks like a big camera, 
and it is slightly heavy, but there's some reasons for that. And I'll tell you why that it doesn't really, it's really not that heavy compared to a lot of kits that you would be using today, or why you might actually like the weight of this for just getting smoother shots. Five inch touch screen on top that operates the entire camera. It has one cable coming out of it. This, this person, I borrowed this from my friend Paul, his actually has this kind of long extension cable on it. That way you can remove the monitor and move it around wherever you want. But on the later builds, the DSMC2 versions of this body, this actually had a connector on the bottom of it and you can mount it right on top of the camera and not have any cable at all. And that to me is just something that's so amazing. I really don't like cables. My Komodo kit has three cables running on it right now. I really don't like that. The reason I think that these old bodies just have a huge leg up compared to some of the modern bodies is that they just don't have any cables running on them. And that's really interesting to me. Cause even on the back here, you know, you've got your V-mount plate. Well, the V-mount plate is just attached right on there without any cables at all. Now his kit does have an A-box attached to it with another cable and so on and so forth. But these, these bodies have all this modulation on them. So you can attach basically anything to them without cables if you buy the red product, which were very expensive, mind you, when they came out. But right now everything's much cheaper. They come with this proprietary SSD slot. That was kind of a bummer at the time, but right now still very inexpensive and everything's made out of metal and it's just really rock solid. Like this is a rock solid. This is a tank of a camera and you will not be disappointed by the build quality of this camera. Giant fans on top. This one actually has the fan upgrade, which you could get once you got the dragon sensor in them. And then one of the coolest parts about this body that I really, really love is this side handle. So this side handle here has all these controls on it to be able to operate the camera by yourself, just using your hand. And then the biggest bonus is it comes with this little battery slot, red volt battery. So you can technically operate this camera without a battery on the back, a V mount or a gold mount if you didn't want to. Now granted these batteries die very, really fast. And when I first started my career, we used <laughs> these batteries a lot and they lasted like 25 minutes. It's really not worth it. But what is really cool about this battery is that if you need to go slim, if you need to throw it on a gimbal, you can remove basically everything off this body, remove the V mount plate, remove the top handle and this, and you can have a still working camera with a battery in it. And then likewise, you can also hot swap batteries. So if you have a V-mount on the back, you can remove the V-mount and put another V-mount on and the camera can still be on and running. You don't have to turn it off. Cause these old red cameras, even the new red cameras take, you know, 25 seconds, 30 seconds to boot up. So you don't really want to turn them off if you don't need to. Another thing that's really great is that they have these amazing lens mount options. This is a PL mount here that you can pull off with four screws. You can put an EF mount on there with electronic contacts on it, Leica M mount on there, Nikon mount on there. Just how this was set up, this makes it really easy to have a rock solid mount on it. First, all these adapters that we use now on mirrorless setups that we're putting PL mounts on there and everything's being weighted on that little mount. This one is bolted to the camera. Um, it's just a much, much, much more professional and rugged way of working. What's also nice about the side handle is that you can record and stop from here. You can change your shutter speed, all that stuff all from the side handle, very, very handy. Now this is the DSMC-1 body. These are going for pretty inexpensive. If you get the Dragon sensor upgrade, you could probably get this kit somewhere under five grand right now, maybe around five grand, depending on what comes with the accessories. Um, online, you know, on Facebook Marketplace, eBay, used somewhere on B&H or Adorama or something like that. A lot of people are still asking maybe six grand for this kit, just because that Dragon sensor is so good. And because when this these cameras had come out, we were talking, 35 to 50 thousand dollar range so it's come down a lot in the last eight to ten years hey spencer from the future something else worth mentioning is that when you buy into the red dsmc1 or dsmc2 body style you can actually upgrade your body while keeping all of the accessories from like a financial standpoint that's really nice so say you buy a red epic mx to start right you're buying that kit for something like 3,000 3,500 bucks and then you want to upgrade to a dragon body so you simply sell one body buy another body you're not out very much money and you get to keep all of your accessories that worked on that original body because they're the same bodies it's not like going from an fx6 to a Venice where you have to buy all new stuff, right? You have to buy a whole new body, which costs, costs a lot of money. These actually swap out, they're interchangeable. The monitors work on the same body. The V-mount plates work on the same body. Something that I would definitely consider would be getting something like a Dragon X, the DSMC2 version, and then later upgrading to like a Gemini, which has dual native ISO or a Helium, which has 8K. You know, if these are the things that you want and you want to upgrade later, that's how they were designed. That was the path that Red initially did. But then they kind of abandoned that now because there's no reason to do that. But that's something that still would work for you if you're trying to get into this and spend less money. Okay, back to the edit. 
So before we move on into the video, I do want to talk about this video's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to present your work online. You can start with one of their best-in-class templates, or using Squarespace's next-generation web design system, Fluid Engine, you can customize every detail with the reimagined drag-and-drop technology for desktop or mobile. Or maybe you want to start an online store to sell your photography or other products. Squarespace has all the built-in functionality to get one of those up and running quickly, and I've actually been using Squarespace to run my online stores for almost a decade now. And of course, if you're like me, you're probably looking to build a portfolio, which Squarespace has ton of features for that very thing. You can even create private galleries for client work using these tools. So if you're looking for a home for your work, well, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off. And I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So you're getting a super 35 millimeter sensor. It's actually a little bigger than that. A lot of people claim that it's a 1.1X sensor compared to full frame. If you go look on Red's website and you do all the crop factoring, they are not saying that. I think it's more close to like a 1.3, 1.35 um, X sensor. It is bigger than something like the Komodo or any of the other super 35 millimeter sensors in the Red lineup, but it's not as big as a lot of people claim. But that is something you need to think about that if you're using a super 35 millimeter lens on here, it might have some vignetting depending on which one you use. But that's shooting basically like open gate. They don't call it open gate, but the full sensor, it's more of a 17 by nine sensor versus the 16 by nine you'll probably crop into and actually shoot and frame for. And when talking about the sensor, we, we can talk about the frame rates and the cropping. What's really great about this camera, and especially compared to something like the Komodo that I have now. The, my Komodo setup probably costs more than this setup, right? So if I was in the market right now for a Komodo, you might also want to consider something like an old Red Dragon or even an old just regular Epic MX because really the specs are pretty similar. Actually the Red Komodo, you know, it's a super 35 millimeter sensor and it's limited to 40 frames per second using the full sensor readout. Whereas the Red Dragon, this one actually goes up to 82 frames per second with the full sensor. And that's still shooting at the Red Raw compression, which I should have talked about earlier and I haven't talked about, but it still shoots the Red Raw, the, the Red Raw that we've all known and loved for this long, just an amazing workflow. What's cool about Red Raw is that because it's not compressed very much, it runs on even some slow computers. It gives you all the, the options on the back end, obviously, to change your ISO and your white balance. And what's even cool about this too, even though this is an old camera, what they call a legacy camera, it has the legacy color on it. You can actually change it to the Dragon color, which was an updated color pipeline that they did when they came out with the Dragon sensor. Or you can even, just with one drop down, change it to the new IPP2 Log 3G10 that we're using on the Red Komodo and the new Raptors. So I can directly match this camera with my Komodo the best I can, they are different sensors, but using the exact same color pipeline even though this camera is very old. But they did update it just enough that you can do that in something like DaVinci Resolve or whatever. And so that's why I was testing this camera because I was like looking for a B camera for my Komodo and I went down this rabbit hole, I could get an entire kit with batteries and a monitor and all the accessories for less than a red Komodo kit even used. Kind of got me really intrigued by this idea. But back to the frame rates real quick, if you do want even higher frame rates than 82 frames per second at 6K. Granted, I didn't mention that part that the Red Dragon was 5K, but then they updated it to 6K with just the firmware so everyone could now get more of that sensor out of it. So actually, if you get a Dragon kit, it might say 5K on it, but it will actually shoot 6K. So 6K, 82 frames per second. You can keep cropping in and get even higher frame rates. I think it'll even do up to something past 300 frames per second if you crop into like 2K. I don't remember the exact specs, but it, it gets really high. Now granted, because it is real raw, and it's not doing anything special on the back end, it's going to crop in on that sensor to get those higher frame rates, but it's such a great thing that you have that. So I feel like I could talk so much about this camera, but let's talk about really the purpose of why I'm talking about it today. I'm comparing it to something like an FX3 or an FX6, whereas an FX3 kit, right, is gonna run you close to $4,000. It's gonna be small and light and compact. It's gonna give you 4K and full frame and good low light. Yes, but for $4,000, you can get this camera that is going to give you that red raw, and it's gonna give you a sensor that, to me, looks more pleasing. So FX3 has a great image, but it is being compressed to 10-bit, and you are getting these colors baked into the image 
that if you don't like those colors, if you don't like to deal with those colors, you have to futz with them quite a bit in post, but you're only using a 10 bit image and that might be harder to fix. Whereas this camera is giving you that red raw, it's giving you direct sensor readout. And for me, I just like the look of these sensors. Maybe it's just because I'm a David Fincher fan or something, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I've been shooting on red for so long. But to me, there's so much more texture in the image because it's raw. It's not being noise reduced. There's nothing messing with the image. You're just getting what you're supposed to get out of it. It's really easy to catch, in my opinion, a red image because of the texture that comes out of it. Now, a lot of people think the texture is too sharp and I understand that. And I think by sharp, they just mean it looks too real, like in a bad way, it doesn't look cinematic in that way. For me, I like the look. I like how it performs. I like that I'm just getting the most bare bones raw version of something that I can get. To me, I just prefer that. So if you're in that same camp, you might prefer something like an old RED camera versus a new Sony camera. And you can't deny that the 16-bit, 12-bit, whatever you wanna call it, raw, is just one of the best things to work with. It's just one of the best codecs to work with. I promise you, you once you start using it, you'll see why you would like that so much. So we're talking about similar price points here. An FX6 kit, I mean, $6,000 plus some batteries, you're at $7,000. And you could get DSMC2 Red Dragon kit, which the DSMC2 body is much nicer. It has more processing power in it, has better fans in it. It has a nicer touch screen on it. Um, you get a four inch or a seven inch touch screen. You can get a cableless touch screen, which to me is one of the coolest things that about the whole system is that you can be running an entire kit with no cables on it if you wanted to. They have a secondary side handle you can get that still has a record function on it. I think that kit is the one that I would try to get if I could, but the $7,000 price point is kind of steep. You can still get a lot of other things for $7,000. So it kind of makes it tricky for me. Um, you're, you're getting closer to that Komodo X territory, which really a Komodo X is kind of like the new version of the Dragon in a way. Um, it has a lot of the same features. Something else I forgot to mention is that there is an OLPF stack behind your mount on the camera and you can swap those out, which you can't do that one on most cameras. They just have one on there. Well, this one has a skin tone one, a highlight one, and a low light one. Um, I don't like that sort of. It's cool that you can swap them out if you need to, but I don't like that like you get more out of one over the other when you really, it'd be nice if you could just have one OLPF that just did it all. And a downside of these OLPFs, if you do shoot them out at the sun, with your lens stopped down, you will see some kind of red refraction inside the lens, which has been a problem of reds for a while. They finally do not have that problem anymore. Komodos don't do that. Komodo X doesn't do that. Raptors don't do that. But these old ones did because they had that old OLPF stack in there. So that's kind of a downside. Another downside, since we're talking about those, is that it's an old camera. RED actually has stopped working on these cameras. Um, I th they might still be doing it as long as they have parts for it. So that's kind of the downside is you don't have any more warranties or anymore. You can't be like, hey, RED, fix this camera for me. They're like, we're done. We're, we've moved on to our new bodies, so we can't do that anymore. That being said, there's actually quite a few places online that will still fix this camera for you which is great. And I just found that out when I was doing my research for this video and I was pretty stoked about. So if you buy one of these old cameras, you need to fix it, send it in, a little bit of labor, a little bit of parts money, and you can fix it and get it back to new, which is really pretty awesome. It's actually probably harder to do that with a new Sony camera or something. Something else about this camera is that its ISO range is a kind of weird. Its ISO is the same as any other camera, but when you're at 400 on like the Red Komodo or you're at 400 on the Dragon, the Dragon's gonna look but if I treated it like any other camera, exposed for it correctly, using the meters on the RED, I mean, which they have these really awesome meters. They have basically these traffic lights that will tell you if you're blowing out one of your channels in your highlights and even has a noise meter for the noise if you're underexposing, and it'll actually go up higher and higher and tell you that you're creating more noise in the camera. But if I treat this sensor like any other sensor and just make sure I don't do that, then everything comes out perfectly clean and looks great. And I didn't have any issues with it. I did a test with it side by side with the Komodo and I found very little discrepancy in the images. The color was a little different even using the exact same workflow because they are different sensors, of course. The Highlights did roll off maybe a smidge different than the Komodo, but then also the shadows were different than the Komodo, but they both looked really good and matched really, really, really easily. Changed the ISOs a little bit, a couple different versions of the tint, and we were good to go. So I really wouldn't hesitate to cut these cameras together at all, even though their sensor tech is way different. That being said, the Komodo does handle low light way better, 
it just seems that like light does, more light's going to hit the sensor if you're using the Komodo. Maybe that's because of the OLPF or maybe that's because of some other reason, I don't know. It's just much more sensitive to light. So it is, just feels more modern in that way. So it's just like kind of naturally a cleaner sensor. But I didn't really have any problems with noise when shooting on this sensor um, because I just treated it like you should treat any camera. Okay, I feel like I'm getting a little redundant here, but I just definitely think this camera is worth considering. The image is super, super good. It really is so surprising how good this image looks for how old of a camera it is. And for me, it gives me all the features that I want from a cinema camera. It's just like, it's built really well. It has an amazing menu options. It has amazing mount options. like. When I mount a PL mount on my Komodo and then put a big heavy lens on it, I am always very worried that the mount is going to come loose. And sometimes mine do, you've probably seen in some other videos, I kind of have a loose RF mount on my Komodo. Whereas with this one, you have a rock solid mount. You can buy third party mounts that um, if, are a little cheaper if you need to. You can get an EF mount. I forgot to even mention on the DSMC2, the side handle has this little wheel on the front, which I think this one does too. I don't know if this one functions the same way, but this is kind of a little wheel on the top. There's one of those on the DSMC2 model that you can roll that wheel and it actually is like pulling focus on an autofocus lens. It gives you control of the lens. So if you're walking around by yourself, you can just be pulling your focus. You don't have to buy another Nucleus kit, put that on your lens. It can just do it automatically in the camera. Pretty fun feature. So from my perspective, if you are trying to learn more about cinema, cinema cameras, and you don't have enough money to get a Sony Venice or a Burano or a Raptor or a Komodo X, but you still wanna get, you know, kind of upgrade your kit and get into the real cinema camera line, I really wouldn't hesitate of buying one of these old cameras. A couple of random thoughts before I go on that too. I thought the battery life would suck, but it really doesn't, it's not that bad. Um, it's not as good as the Komodo probably, but it is fine using modern V-mount batteries. You can get really big batteries now for really not that expensive. Um, and so it's really kind of not an issue, especially with having that little red volt in the side that always gives you that extra ability to have an extra 25 minutes or so to hot swap if you need to, or even just run off that battery if you're in a pinch. So I also really like the touch screen. It's a little slower than the Komodo, but it's still pretty snappy. A lot of people online say they're really slow, but really, not much slower than a lot of other things. You can change your ISOs, your white balance, and then also you can change your compression ratio on the RED RAW. So on the modern cameras like the RED Komodo, you only have efficient low quality, low quality, medium quality, and high quality. Whereas on this camera, you just get to choose one. Do you wanna shoot at three to one, which is like the highest you can possibly get out of the camera, or do you wanna shoot at 20 to one, 22 to one, and get a much lower file size, but still get that RED RAW capability. You can just choose your flavor. You get like 22 different flavors versus like four. Now the four is much more streamlined on the new Komodos and I have no complaints about it, but if you're in a pinch where you're like, um, I think that I'm gonna need two hours of footage for this interview, well, you can literally just scroll until you see your SSD say two hours, which is just a really cool feature in still keeping that red raw workflow. There's not really any speed boosters for this, uh, just based on the flange distance of it. There haven't, some people have tried to make some and I think some work. There's some 3D printed models out there. Wouldn't really recommend those. Um, so that's a little bit of a downside for me. Like I like the Red Komodo a lot and I've been shooting a lot on these dew lens lenses and I really like them on the speed booster. Um, just that look that they get because they are kind of a slower lens. At the end of the day, Super 35 millimeter really is like, and has been the standard for cinema for a hundred years. So I have no complaints about that, but having the option on the Komodo is nice. Also because this camera has been out for so long, there are a lot of accessory options for this camera. It's also very module. You can build it out to as big as you want it to be, have as much IO on it as you want, or you can strip it down to a small package. You could even, you know, I think Caleb Pike made a video over this too. You could, if you were to get maybe like an old MX sensor instead of the Dragon sensor, and you wanted to really just spend as little money as possible, you could just get a cheap monitor put on top of it. You could just use the side handle to control the camera rather than using the touchscreen on top and you'd probably save yourself even more money. And you can get third party accessories, the third party V-mount for probably 50 bucks first getting the one that comes with the camera or the red branded ones, which are probably a little bit more money. But overall, I just think it's a really, really awesome camera. And I shot with it this last week and had zero problems with it and was actually really elated by the experience, that full cinema experience. Also, the camera is kind of heavy. You know, the kit fully kitted out between my Komodo and it, it was heavier for sure by maybe a couple pounds, but that weight is nice. When you pick the camera up, just grab onto the side handle and you know, you wouldn't just walk around and start shooting like this. The camera is giving you that weight it's gonna help you get a much steadier shot um, and not have to worry about the jitters that you would get from definitely something like an fx3 
So these cameras are just really awesome. I highly recommend them still in 2024, especially if you just wanna get your hands on a cinema camera, a proper cinema camera and see how those operate. See, it'll teach you more about cinematography, but if you just wanna get like a real cinema camera, play with it and shoot on it for, even if you shot on one of these for a year and then was like, okay, I definitely like this style. I can upgrade to something like a Raptor or a Komodo X or something like that. This is a great way to break into the RED system or just to the cinema camera workflow. And I, Honestly, I just really recommend it in 2024. So I think that's all I'm gonna talk about today. I'm kind of babbling a little bit with this video because I was just really excited to talk about these old cameras that kind of started my career. But as always, until next time, guys, I'm Sutra Sakurai. See ya.